Right here. Right here. And then the camera will get you. Uh, ears good? Hi everyone, I think we're ready to get started now, thanks all for coming, um, it's really nice to see so many people here, and just before um, we get started for tonight, I would just like to begin by acknowledging that the land on which we gather is the traditional territories of the Coast Salish people, including the Musqueam, Squamish and Saratooth nations. So first of all, I'm just going to quickly introduce myself, uh, my name is Ruth Sharp and I'm Public Programs Manager here at the Vancouver Aquarium, um, and I am going to play you a little video uh, just to introduce you to OceanWise and basically, you know, why we do what we do. I am a friend of the ocean. I am an interpreter of the ocean. I am a really big fan of the ocean. I am a child of the ocean. I am a geek of the ocean. <laughs> I am a voice for the ocean. I am constantly amazed by the ocean. I am deeply moved by the ocean. I am mesmerized by the ocean. I am humbled in the presence of the ocean. I am extremely protective of the ocean. I am highly concerned for the ocean. I am a defender of the ocean. I am a guardian of the ocean. I am a diehard supporter of the ocean. I'm a fighter for the ocean. I'm truly appreciative of the ocean every moment of every day. I'm an advocate for all the animals in the ocean. I'm truly grateful for the ocean. I am here to protect the future of the ocean. We're all connected to the ocean. Let's be ocean wise. slide. So if you've ever, if you like that video, keep an, e uh, an eye out because some of the stars of that video are sitting in the theatre right now, so maybe you should get a signature, um, an autograph. Anyway, so a few things that I want to just let you know about. So there's a lot of new and exciting things happening at OceanWise right now. So one of the new things is that we have a podcast, which for me is very exciting because I'm a massive fan of podcasts. Um, so this podcast is called My Ocean. Um, and in this podcast, we profile ocean champions around the world who are doing amazing, big, bold things to conserve our oceans. And we talk to them about the journeys along the, their journeys that they make along the way and what they've learned. So right now there's three episodes, and you can get them on all the regular podcast places, so Stitcher, Google Play, Apple Podcasts. And you can also get them from ocean.org forward slash my ocean. So, yeah, I highly recommend that. Um, another thing is we are currently looking... Um, recruiting for volunteers. So if you, have, if you would like to perhaps volunteer um, in our school program, um, as gallery hosts, or even just as an admin assistant, whether on-site or off-site, there's always opportunities and we're always very happy to have um, as much help as we can. So um, if you're interested, there's some cards outside. Also, you can come speak to me and I can give you some contact details um, and answer any questions that you might have about that. One more thing. Um, well, is that the we have another event coming up next week, Tuesday, 27th of February, which is the second in our Ocean Matters lecture series. And this one um, is going to be about beluga whales, microplastics, and an Inuit community. And it looks like it's going to be a really interesting talk. So I recommend um, registering for that and coming along if you can. And one other thing, well, first of all, Thank you to the gift shop for donating this amazing prize that we'll have a prize draw at the end of the evening. Um, 
the gift shop is um, incredible. I recommend, even if you, you don't have to um, pay to enter the aquarium to go to the gift shop, it's actually really, it's got some awesome things there. And everything that they have there is sustainable. Um, it would have taken, got rid of all plastic related to like plastic wrapping, and they really, really do make a real effort to get everything to be as sustainable um, as possible. And there's also some fantastic gifts there. So, yeah, I recommend if you're passing, pop along to the gift shop, or if you're looking for a, an interesting present for someone, it's a good place to come. And one last thing. Again, thank you all for coming. And as you know, this is a free event. And we put these events on and make them free to make them as accessible as possible to anybody who wants to come and learn about the oceans, learn how to protect the oceans and conserve our environment. But these events are not free to put on. So um, if you have any spare cash, if you have a few dollars in your pocket, it would be fantastic if you could just drop them in the donation box just outside. And by doing that, that would allow us to continue um, running these programs and making them accessible and continue to make them free. So yeah, that would be absolutely fantastic. And with that said, I think that's the last thing I want to say. I'm going to introduce Rachel, who is um, the manager for Canadian Shoreline, Great Canadian Shoreline Cleanup, and she's going to start telling you about what we're actually here tonight. Thanks very much. Hi, everybody. Thank you, Ruth. Um, as Ruth mentioned, my name is Rachel Sheeler, and I am manager of the Great Canadian Shoreline Cleanup. Super stoked to see that um, the theater is filled today and that you're all here to learn with us. It's going to be an awesome evening and we have a great lineup of speakers, so thank you for joining us. Um, as an open water swimmer myself, I personally have a strong connection to our waterways. Uh, the smack of the waves during those long training swims have really taught me to respect our oceans. Um, swimming in those calm summer mornings um, has really made me fall in love with our oceans. And as manager of Great Canadian Shoreline Cleanup and being part of this world and working with the uh, open water swim world as well and meeting all of the people who stand up for and protect our oceans have also made me fight for our oceans. So I thank everybody for that. Um, Great Canadian Shoreline Cleanup is a conservation partnership of OceanWise and WWF Canada. And together, we aim to build an understanding of shoreline litter by encouraging Canadians to rehabilitate their shorelines through cleanups. Each year, we engage somewhere around 60,000 Canadians, which is pretty incredible, on shorelines all across the country, from oceans, lakes, rivers, streams, storm drains, and schoolyards. Everywhere that land connects to water, we are all connected to the oceans. Uh, these volunteers collect and report on the types of litter that they find. They are all citizen scientists and diligently use our data cards uh, to report back to us. Um, they all contribute to a national database that helps us understand the impacts and threats of shoreline litter across Canada. And then we also share that information with International Coastal Cleanup, um, which allows us to uh, contribute to a global database so we can understand the impacts of shoreline litter all across the world. Here are some of our results from 2017. Um, we'll be re releasing a report um, later this week, so keep your eye out for that. Um, but as you can see from these stats, um, just over 30% of what we find on our shorelines, and like, keep in mind, this is from over 60,000 volunteers um, on nearly 2,000 shorelines. So it's a lot of information that we have. Um, over 30% of that is from single-use food and beverage items, um, which a number of them are plastic. Um, and then... You can also see a large chunk of that, over 36% is tiny trash. Those are those small pieces of um, foam and plastic. So I'm super excited that you're here tonight to hear from Ocean Legacy and to hear from Surfrider Vancouver on solutions. There's definitely ways that we can work together to um, reduce the impacts of these materials on our shorelines uh, and truly make a difference. And as I said, super thrilled to be working with so many amazing groups. We work with people all across the country, and having Ocean Legacy and Surfrider Vancouver right in our backyard is incredible. Um, and we encourage you to join us. Uh, lead a shoreline cleanup. Track what you find. Share it with us. 
volunteer with Surf Rider Vancouver, volunteer with Ocean Legacy, get involved in your community. Um, it's an amazing group of people and we're always looking for more people to join us. And I also encourage you to follow us. Um, all of our social media channels are up there. There's a lot to learn um, and there's a lot to take in and we're trying to share as much information around um, solutions and impacts that we can in a digestible way to help you through that journey. So follow us and um, we're, we're happy to walk through that with you. Um, and then with that, I would like to introduce um, Madhu, who is the Director of Education at Ocean Legacy, and he will start the conversation. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for coming, and uh, it's really amazing to see all of you guys. And uh, I have uh, two of my colleagues uh, from Ocean Legacy. I'm Madhu, I'm the Director of Education for the Ocean Legacy. Uh, I work with Ocean Legacy like uh, almost two years now. So we are, as an organization, with our co-organizations, uh, co like, like all uh, surf riders and like bunch of other organizations and uh, shoreline cleanups and everyone. We are trying to find solutions to uh, marine debris issues as, a, as like not separate groups, as a one family and uh, create the network in between us and go beyond from there. Tyler? Yeah. Uh, hey, my name is Taylor. Um, I've been with Ocean Legacy for a little while now, uh, helping them with social media and photography and uh, spreading the word and yeah, pass it on Gina. <laughs> Hi, my name is Gina Hopkins. I've been with Ocean Legacy for about two years. I've done four expeditions with them to Nootka Island, Brooks Peninsula, Cayuque, Kay um, Ahauzit, a lot of the west coast of Vancouver Island. And yeah, so here we are. <laughs> so we uh, just wanted to start off with a short little video um, that kind of presented by Lush just explains a bit more about the Ocean Legacy and uh, what's like on these expeditions. My name is Chloe Dubois, and I am the co-founder of the Ocean Legacy Foundation. teaching people about the effects of plastic pollution on the marine environment. We take groups of people out to incredibly remote locations and clean up marine debris. Right now we're in uh, Squiddy Bay Marine Provincial Park in Laskidi Island near the southern end. Our mission was to come clean up the beaches that were reported as hotspots. So there's material all in here, all along this coastline. I got involved with Ocean Legacy just because they do things a lot differently than most other groups. And I was really inspired. I wanted to make time to help out and kind of spread the word of what they do and capture what they do. I see lots of videos, I see a lot of things about the state of our, our ocean and our beaches and stuff, but I wanted to see for myself. 
At first glance, you know, it's just kind of like, oh, this is a beautiful area, classic West Coast beach. And then you look closer and closer, and you just see how dirty they are. Toothbrushes, plastics, metal, scrap, rope, you name it. But the worst that we've seen out here is styrofoam. This is a styrofoam pit, <laughs> polystyrene material. And it's um, caused by large chunks of styrofoam wash up on the beach from docks and basically break up. And then we get these pits. We found pits that are close to two meters deep along various shorelines. Pretty nasty stuff. I mean, once, once it breaks up, you get these millions of these small pellets, and they're virtually impossible to remove from the environment. Huge issue. Not a lot of solutions right now for this stuff, so working on it. These beautiful places, they mean something to me. I really enjoy these places and I really like to see them protected and cared for. So when I arrive to these beaches and I just see them trashed and littered, it really bothers me. And the more you dig, the more you find, and the more logs you lift up, the more you find. It's just really sad. When people come on our expeditions, it changes people's lives on such a fundamental level because they're able to really see their impact in the world and how their consumption affects the world directly. Most people will vow to never use styrofoam again or to change their plastic habits. All these little changes in one person's life can make such a big difference if we all start doing that together. All right, I hope you guys enjoyed the video. Um, I really admire the work that uh, Chloe and James do in you know, creating these organizations and all the other people creating these organizations that are uh, so passionate about this and really want to make a difference. Um, so we're just going to get into and explain a bit more about what we do um, at Ocean Legacy. So these are all the little breakdowns I'll be going through. This is our long-term vision. Oh. <laughs> Ignore that. Um, so basically to assist in uh, local and international communities in developing tools such as long-term education, 
shoreline cleanup efforts, and plastic to fuel technologies. So a big thing is online mapping. So on the website, uh, it's all interactive. You can kind of create you know, hotspots with GPS locations, a little bit of a story and pictures to show what you know, needs to be cleaned up and where it is, and we can have all that data stored online. Um, and then kind of connect with different communities to create you know, movement and uh, you know, go and actually clean it up. Um, and it kind of connects us to these areas. So here's an example of what it looks like. So someone would have said, you know, there's a lot of debris on these beaches here. Um, it would be all be in our system, and then we kind of figure out, you know, where we're going to anchor in, um, how we're going to, you know, remove it or clean it up. You know, a lot of these expeditions is kind of remote, so it'd be camping. So you'd probably like be tenting somewhere here, close to the beach. And then each day, everyone would go out and you know tackle it, you know, piece by piece. Um, so it's a global directory, so that way you know we can share this with different organizations, and we can all kind of work together to help clean it up and make that difference. Um, so yeah, so it's kind of finding allies and allies and join the local initiatives and collaborate with different groups. And Gina's uh, going to uh, speak a bit more of the expeditions. So with the assistance of our global map, we organize expeditions to isolate plastic polluted areas. We engage with those communi communities to remediate the natural environment. We use plastic to oil technologies and we research while we're there. Um, we collect data for the following, so doing NOAA marine debris surveys, um, doing training from the NOAA s field guides, also to research and develop of development of the plastic to oil technology. Um, yeah, so our expeditions are pretty life-changing. Whoever goes on them usually comes back with a lot more open eyes and a way of seeing the world. Um, so a lot of the time at the end of the, the long day in the sun, We'll get all the, the materials together after dragging it for miles and miles and miles along the beach, and we pile it up and kind of see what our treasure is. Um, so this is kind of what a remote cleanup would look like. There's some pictures of a couple of our expeditions that we've been on. A lot of um, fishing floats, fishing buoys, styrofoam, water bottles, metal tires, everything. It just we dig for it and we find it. Uh, this is from one of our expeditions on Laskidi, and Taylor took these photos. He can tell you a bit about them. Um, yeah, so I had the opportunity last year to join on one of these expeditions, and I didn't really know what to expect, but I didn't realize how much it would uh, you know, make an impact on my life and kind of change the way I view things. and. Uh, made a lot of difference, like consume more mindfully and eliminate so many different plastics and single uses in my life. Um, just kind of seeing it firsthand and being there and dealing with it, it just really makes you think about it and the actions and how you might have something and then you kind of throw it in the garbage or throw it away and it never, you know, you don't have to think about it, but it goes somewhere and it affects people and places. So kind of seeing the whole, um, how it all breaks down and then kind of the full circle, I guess. It, uh, yeah, it was really impactful. And I just want to share, w you know, what I learned and hopefully inspire others to kind of make those changes and kind of dig a bit deeper and figure out, you know, how it all comes together and how you can make that difference and, yeah, and protect these places and care for them more. Um, this was the haul that we got from a three-week expedition up to Brooks Peninsula, which is just north of Cayuca on the west coast of Vancouver Island. Um, so three weeks, about 10 to 15 volunteers. I saw a few of them here today, which was awesome. Um, so we had set up a base camp, and then we would go out, and we'd have a map of where we'd want to clean. And so every couple of days, we would go to a new beach, scour the beaches, 
and clean up all the materials. And we call these um, white bags super sacks. They're meter by meter bags that we put all of the materials into. And while we're on the beaches, we actually try to pre-sort them. So all of the plastic water bottles in one, all the hard plastics in another, then all the mixed materials in another. Um, there is so much, it's overwhelming. Um, you'll see in our future slides that we've had over 700 of these bags last year that we had to sort. Um, so all the pre-sorting does help. <laughs> and yeah, this is a pretty amazing haul in three weeks for about 15 people to get together. Um, we also were working with the Nichalawit Tribal Council on this clean as well. So uh, the other thing we are working on, we are try to, uh, try to educate and create different education programs with the different communities, colleges, universities, and uh, all these areas. And uh, we are trying to create all the, uh, uh, people call it garbage. We want to call it resources. We want to add a market value to it. So then people will try to, uh, instead of g uh, getting rid of that to the landfill, they will try to do a, uh, have a market with the market value we try they try to like recycle it reuse it and upcycle it so that's what we are trying to do so you can see like these kind of like different materials like we've seen it everywhere so what we did especially with the uh, lush so we are chipping all of these plastics and all of these plastics are uh, going back to lush packaging so we will talk about that in uh, in uh, future slides. So that kind of environment we can create. All of us can get together, think outside of the box, and then we can make a change. So these are the some of the materials as you can see. Like this is all single use materials. Like this is from a coffee cup. Like every morning, uh, like you know thousands and thousands and thousands of people, like they go to the coffee shop and get a coffee and go to work. And end of the day these will end up in our shorelines. And uh, with our sorting this year, we did about 60,000 kilos, 60 to 65 tons of materials came from uh, all of these uh, 18 different organizations from Vancouver Island, and we had to sort it out. And uh, when you're sorting, we've seen uh, bottles coming from, like water bottles from Singapore, and we've seen things from Korea, Japan, Taiwan, China, like everywhere you can think of. So if we can stop using it, if we can say no to this, we can make a difference. So that's what we are trying to do here. So this is uh, not this year, last year, our cleanup. So this is Daxter, he's our technician uh, for our ship and everything. So from the beginning of the Ocean Legacy, these guys work with us. So this is what you've seen earlier with the expedition. So this is what we got. All of these materials got separated and uh, all the hard plastic went to a lush packaging that was the starting point for that project. And rest of the materials, we were able to upcycle, recycle, reuse our over 90% of these material. So we got 25 tons uh, that year and we only end up putting 526 kilos of uh, landfill, everything else was uh, used in different uh, resources. I guess we know this guy right here, yeah. right here. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, yeah, so all of these guys work with us, so these are the pictures from uh, last year, I mean year before. So we had uh, lots of different categories. We had uh, over 25 categories this year, last year we had about uh, 13, 14 categories, so we had more categories. So this is Chloe, our co-founder. She will be explaining what are the different categories we have. You will have some idea what are we talking about. We ended up um, kind of coming up with a very detailed category system. So we have about 20 categories now um, of how we are recycling and separating all of the, the marine debris materials that are coming in. So um, you can see textiles, uh, shoes, and flip-flops. These are actually all going to an artist, Peter Clarkson, um, out of Tofino. So last year we gave Peter about 202 pounds of flip-flops and random shoes um, that he will um, turn into some beautiful art. 
Um, we've got rubber, glass, rope, um, our landfill section um, for laminated materials and a lot of contaminated soil. Um, metal, we have foam floats, broken foam floats, we have hard plastic floats, broken hard plastic floats. Um, and foam actually is one of our most complex categories. Um, we've got uh, blue, pink, white, kind of EPS style foam. We have yellow, polyurethane, white chrome, uh, polystyrene, and then a dirty white uh, polystyrene. Uh, right now. So as you can see, so those are the different categories we had this year. So you can see some of them right here. So how this material end up, I'll, I'll share with you some of the information how we up, uh, upcycle, recycle, reuse these uh, materials. So hard plastic, all of the hard plastic uh, we find, we ship it, uh, we send it to Toronto. There's a factory, they do the process for us, they create the plastic pallets out of that, and that goes back to lush packaging. So if you see any lush uh, black parts in lush dough, so those spots carry in 5% of marine plastic. So that was a huge uh, achievement we did with Lush. Lush uh, really wanted to do that. I worked for Lush 10 years. That's how I got to know Ocean Legacy. So that's one of the things we do with hard plastic at the moment. And uh, Lush also trying to use the bottles, water bottles. Uh, we already sent the samples. We are waiting for the results. So when we get the results, we hopefully we can use that as a packaging too. And, uh, Foam only, there's a company uh, based in Vancouver. They use all the foam materials, like a styrofoam is the biggest issue we have. Like uh, you guys probably seen earlier with the Clovis video. So there was a one pit I came across in uh, Nelson Island. So I dig down like probably 1.5 meters and close to two meters and it's keep coming up. And we have no way to take that to us because uh, like if you focus on one point, you can dig that point for like three hours and you cannot finish it. So it's not productive. So sometimes we have to give it up because we don't have a solution at the moment. And what we, what we do, like we go and uh, pick up tires and the plastics and rest of the materials we can gather and uh, carry those materials out. So uh, for the styrofoam, we have that uh, foam only company. They uh, compress that material and make the, uh, some construction material out of that. And uh, boobies, good boobies, all the good ones, we send it back to reuse. And uh, same with the floats and metal and uh, glass. We recycle those. Some of the glass goes to art projects. And uh, all the flip flops goes to art project. And uh, wood and paper and the cardboard and things we, can, we are able to recycle. And tires, we have a company and we send it to them. So we they uh, uh, chip the tires and they use it to remake the tires. So that's also recycled. And uh, we have uh, one project going on with the aquarium right now. So we gave them some uh, some of our marine debris and uh, it will be showing here I think for a few years or some period of time and uh, it will coming up as an art project so that will be amazing. And uh, so that's why like when we got those Marine debris, it looks like a one bag and landfill, but we can like go to these different categories. And if you really work on it, we create a last year, two weeks, 14 days uh, upcycle challenge, and we were able to do that 25,000 kilos in that two weeks. So this year, we thought we can do it in two weeks. So we did the 14 days challenge again, and uh, we end up getting uh, 65 tons, and we, uh, sold our materials over a month <laughs> and she was camping there pretty much <laughs> and I was here and there uh, he's coming going and uh, Caroline like all of us like it's a, it's a teamwork and like you know uh, same thing like Monique were there and like sorting with us and uh, show line clean up everyone get together so we need people we need support and we need people to think outside of the box again so if we really put our energy into separating these things finding places we can reuse, recycle, upcycle, and that's good, then we can get rid of it. But before that, if we can stop using plastic, so that is the best solution we have right now. So this is the lush. So this is how it's turned out uh, right now. So all of this plastic we find like Surf Rider or whoever organization like 
This year we got, as I said, like 18 different organizations send us materials. So we separate it to hard plastic, goes to Toronto, and create the pallets, and it's end up as these lush parts. So it's a huge thing, and lush or pain for all the shipping and everything. So we just get the material and send it to them, and like they deal uh, with that afterwards. So this is pretty phenomenal. It's not they're trying to show off. They're not marketing it. Nothing like that. They really wanted to make a difference. So because of that, we have this project and. Uh, we will be continuing this project as uh, long as we can, for sure. So um, we keep talking about plastic to fuel. So this is a technology that we're trying to invest in right now. And we want to create a mobile one-ton unit um, that we can take out of Canada and bring down to areas such as like Panama, Costa Rica, Nicaragua, where there is no recycling facilities there. Um, basically, what happens is we can use resin codes two, four, five, six, and some ropes, um, and we put them into an oxygen-free vacuum chamber where they are vaporized using really intense temperatures of more than 400 degrees Celsius. Um, this is pyrolysis. It's the thermal degradation of a material, and in this case, it's plastic. Um, so we are taking the long hydrocarbon chains which form the plastic and we use that we use and we are essentially short fusing these chains back into a fuel source that originally made the plastics. So using the control settings, the vapor is then recondensed into a light crude oil which can produce diesel, petroleum or kerosene oil products with an additional distillation process at the end. Um, our byproducts are a carbon char or carbon black. Um, this can be sold to the industry for many uses, including coloring cement. It is a benign product that has been tested and it is essentially just a carbon. Um, the other byproduct is a methane gas, which gets broken down into carbon dioxide and water vapor using a catalytic converter. Um, it's also really important to note that like a lot of countries don't have proper recycling facilities and a lot of the waste is just getting burned in uncontrolled environments. So for every kilo of plastic burnt, um, 2.77 kilos of carbon emissions are released. So using pyrolysis offers a cleaner solution um, and it gives a valuable product and helps reduce our dependency on virgin oil, oil sources while we move on to renew renewable energy. So this is one of our solutions for plastic. Um, ideally, we would also like to keep reusing, just stop the use of plastics in general as well. And this is a, we have a prototype machine right now. Uh, uh, we got it a long time ago. So this, this is an indicator for that. Like, and then we will end up, uh, we made the diesel. If you go to our website, you will see uh, some of the processes. So this is the diesel we made out of hard plastic. It's not a urine sample. <laughs> <laughs> Looks like it, but yeah. So yeah, so we, like uh, as example, like uh, we did an expedition in Panama a few weeks ago. And uh, when we went to Panama, Chloe we were there and uh, we got some videos and it's, it's insane. Like they have so much plastic. And in, uh, in BC right now, we have some trucking companies help us last year to get material, uh, especially surf rider uh, Tofino sent us lots of material uh, from Tofino to here because we had free trucking system and there are no carbon footprint behind it, so nothing. Because uh, those trucks coming empty to Vancouver, so they offer us to bring the materials here. But when it comes to places like Panama, Costa Rica, and like remote locations, we do not have that luxury to bring those materials to Vancouver or like any areas, do the same process we do here. So then we have to look for other solutions. That's how we end up with the uh, plastic to uh, fuel uh, technology. So our target, as she said, like we can, if we can create a, a mobile unit, so then we can bring that unit to that a specific location so we can turn that uh, marine debris into valuable resource. And this is some of the events uh, we were able to work on. We did uh, quite a few uh, projects with the schools and uh, showing them like what we can do with plastic and also the other materials. 
and uh, this is some of the things you can you can you guys can help with us like to uh, develop and uh, if you see a spot somewhere you know on your vacation or whatever it is please uh, go and report that site and uh, like you know that will help us to identify what are the real hotspots uh, around this our coast and over that so then we can identify create a expeditions and clean those areas out and uh, you can contribute with the equipment and uh, financially donate us. And uh, please share your, like whatever, whenever you've seen something important to you and you can make a difference on someone's uh, life, please share those things in social media, whatever available platforms. And uh, come and join us whenever you can. And uh, we have lots of events going on and we will be working with uh, some of the universities pretty soon to create a microplastic database too, which we don't have in BC right now. So please join us. Also, we are working on uh, with the Canadian uh, Parliament right now with the old organizations uh, uh, here. We wanted to create uh, legislations uh, behind marine, uh, uh, marine uh, debris issues. Yeah. So uh, that's something very important to us because we don't have any background. So Gina will explain like what we wanted to do help us out to uh, develop this program too. Yeah, so we've been working with a member of parliament. His name is Gord Johns. He is the NDP leader in the Courtney Alberni region on Vancouver Island. And um, we have been working with him for a few months now. And I'm gonna just read this bill that he's trying to get passed. And this affects everyone and this is what we can all do together. Um, so it says, in the opinion of the house that the government should work with the provinces, municipalities, and indigenous communities to develop a national strategy to combat plastic pollution in and around aquatic environments, which would include the following measures. Regulations aimed at reducing, one, plastic debris discharge from stormwater outfalls, two, industrial use of microplastics, including but not limited to microbeads, nurdles, fibrous microplastics and fragments, three, consumer and industrial use of single-use plastics, including but not limited to consumer and industrial use of single-use plastics, um, plastic bags, bottles, straws, tableware, polystyrene foam, cigarette filters, and beverage containers, and permanent dedicated and annual funding for the cleanup of derelict fishing gear, community-led projects to clean up plastic and debris on shorelines, banks, beaches, and other aquatic surfaces, and education and outreach campaigns on the root cause of negative environmental effects of plastic pollution in and around all bodies of water. So we are collecting signatures that we are going to be sending to Gord to present to the House of Commons. He's currently there trying to get M151 passed. So if you guys would like to sign or share this with your friends, colleagues, family, everyone, we're trying to get as many signatures as possible to start creating some change from the government down. Thank you so much for having us. It means a lot to us. So let's step up and let's be a, like, we can be a heroes. We can make the change. So you guys like, you know, this is your evening. You can stay home and watch TV, watch a game or hockey or like Olympics, whatever it is. But you're here because you wanted to make the change. So let's get together as a group, get together as a family. Let's make a difference and let's do something means to you and all of us. And uh, let's, uh, work together and uh, hoping to see you guys again soon and come and help us whenever we have stuff going on too. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank morning. you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Everything we do so far is just shoreline. Um, offshore, I'd imagine there'd be a lot more skill involved in just being on a boat and safety that way. Whereas right now, when we can be on the shore, it's a lot safer for our volunteers. But I'd like to move forward with the offshore in the future.
It is available online. Um, I can find me and I'll give you the link after. I should, I should have wrote it up there. Where can we find the petition online? Ask me. I'm, I'm pretty sure it's under the House of Commons elections website. Um, I have it saved though. On our Facebook page as well, or on our website, or on our Instagram. We have links to it too. We'll but I should, page, so we'll post it on the event page. <laughs> <laughs> Will the plastic to fuel machine take any kind of plastic? No, just two, four, five, and six. Um, with the plastic to fuel machine in Canada, how is it being used? We haven't taken it yet. We are in the process of building the machine so still. How receptive are the communities, um, such as Panama, to the plastic to fuel technology? Um, Chloe is. She's the founder. She's currently in Costa Rica right now doing networking. She was just in Panama last month doing more networking. I haven't heard back yet. She gets back at midnight tonight, <laughs> so we'll see. Um, but from what I know, very responsive. Anything to kind of work together to combat this plastic problem. It's a global issue, and I think everyone wants to clean up their environment together. Yeah, we actually do know NOAA surveys. Okay, so, <laughs> okay, so once we clean a beach, does the plastic return the following year? Yes, it does. So we are doing surveys and we are returning to the same beaches that we have previously cleaned so we can see how much accumulated in that one year, year so we can actually start a database as well so we can track the amounts that's landing on our shores. We need more funding. <laughs> <laughs> um, I believe it's about half a million. That's for the unit that we designed, yes. Yeah. How far are we into the funding? Slow and steady. <laughs> mm, we have a five year plan. Mm -hmm. We, um, the use for the converter here? Yes, we would like to use it here as well. Um, currently, we have a small tabletop um, kind of prototype of it, but not enough, like it, we need a larger scale one to do the amount of plastic that we get. So right now we can do like small kind of handfuls full, but we need to be able to dump large amounts in. So we need a larger scale model. I have to. Okay. Uh, two questions. Follow up on um, Gore Jones. Um, do uh, where are we with numbers, and how many more signatures do we need? Do we know? As of today, we have about 1,200 signatures. As many as possible would be. There's no number we're trying to get as yeah, much as possible. Yeah, there's no like, you get this number and y you pass. It's just as many signatures as the people of Canada and and everywhere will sign. And it's also just not Canadians as well, everyone can sign it. Cool. Mm -hmm. uh, second question, expeditions. What does it take to become a part of one? Um, as for some outside of organization who wants to participate, uh, do they need to pay? Do they need to weigh in a waiting list? Or how easy it is to become a part of that? Um, you don't need to pay and there is no waiting list, um, but we do want to see your involvement within the organization. So coming to help sort materials, help work on our ship, just kind of help volunteer time since it is all volunteer run. There is a lot of work to do and we definitely look at the people who do time helping, helping out. <laughs> do, you, do you ever have issues with the uh, number of people that you're trying to get? Um, no, we usually have quite a lot of people who, who would like to attend. Mm -hmm. um, so how do you guys do this full time um, without earning a wage? 
I have two other jobs. Okay. This is my free time activity. <laughs> Hi, just because you guys do so much work on Vancouver Island, I was wondering, are you based in Vancouver or on the island? Where do you do all the sorting? We're based in Vancouver here. Um, we currently have a warehouse down on South Marine Drive and Main Street. We are actually looking for a new warehouse space, so if anyone has land or a warehouse space, let us know. Yeah. 7,000 square feet, we need. Yeah. <laughs> That's actually very important because uh, <laughs> it's really hard to find the uh, right warehouse in here because lots of warehouses are available, but we need the, uh, we, we should be able to uh, get the volunteers there and do the work. So lots of warehouses doesn't like to have people coming to the warehouse and doing that kind of work. So, so uh, like if you have any resource on that, please help us out because we are looking for new warehouse for us. Um, you guys are doing a great job of um, both bottom up and top down with this parliament um, well, petition. I'm just wondering from your kind of in-depth knowledge of dealing with this issue, are there more organizations that are working from the top down or, or working on designing products that aren't plastic dependent or um, I've seen recently food, like cafeteria food being um, served in plastic that is then returned to the food supplier. It's almost leased. Cool. Um, and just wondering if you guys know more about that and more top-down approaches. So uh, we, we have a good network, so that's one of the things we try to do as an organization, like, you know, uh, show line cleanup, Surf Rider and like lots of other organizations, we are trying to network. So then like we can tackle those all the problems as a one group. So then we are in social media, which is very easy to reach each other out. So then like we, we are trying to build this platform, networking platform, not just Canada, like all around the world. So then we can share this information with each other and work as a team, work as a family, work as a group and get the solution. So that's what we are trying to do. I think if also too just the people say that they don't want plastic and like we try telling these big companies that we don't want plastic, we want something reusable, we want something biodegradable. If we can start showing these companies, hopefully there'll be more and more companies that come up with alternatives and different solutions as well. Um, yeah, like I've seen that there's a kind of saran wrap that's reusable. It's kind of like a wax paper that you just twist up instead of just reusing, and instead of just like tearing off a new sheet every time. So there is changes being made. It's just going to take time for a lot of changes to actually get into the marketplace and people to start catching on. Does that answer your question? Are there any more questions? Uh, thank you for your work. Um, I guess I just have maybe a more devil's advocate or philosophical question. Um, I noticed in some of the images there was some rope that looked like it was almost totally decomposed and some of, you mentioned digging for hours to dig up styrofoam. I'm wondering, and I didn't see a lot of like ailing wildlife or like, you know, strangled seals or any of the things, the sort of images that you associate with the negative impacts mm -hmm. of plastic on life and biodiversity. Is some of this work, um, or is some of the, these shoreline cleanups of trash on, in remote beaches, is it offending an, an aesthetic, a human aesthetic sensibility, or is there, could you speak more to the potential negative consequences to ecology or biology? I mean, why not just leave it in the ground? Okay. Um, so, I wish Chloe was here. She's our scientist of the group. <laughs> um, so, we have found um, different materials, such as big, um, blue barrels that have animals have crawled inside and then got trapped and died inside of it. So we have found negative implications on wildlife as well too. And a lot of these plastics, as they slowly degrade, they leach all of their toxins back into the soil and into the earth. And 
yeah, overall, we just need to get rid of them. We need to remove them out of our environment. There's beaches that nobody lives on. There's no one that lives on these islands, and yet they're littered with plastic and trash and debris and materials. And that just doesn't seem right. Okay. Yes. <laughs> Um, in addition to that, at OceanWise, we have a team that um, focuses on disentanglement of animals. So we have lots of stats on what animals are getting entangled in and um, where. Um, so we can share more details on that. And then we also have a team that is um, continuing to conduct research to understand how plastics make their way into the food chain and up the food chain. Um, so there's definitely examples of how those materials are making their way into wildlife and are continuing to move up. And with that in mind, if you're interested, you come to the lecture next Tuesday. That's what it's going to be about. I just wanted to add a little bit to that. Um, I'm not a scientist e officially yet, <laughs> but I've studied this topic. Um, the plastic, no matter where it ends up, does degrade, and like you're saying, the tiny particles, and they're toxic, and that's now everywhere in our oceans. And it's not necessarily that cleaning up one beach is gonna change that. I think the educational component is probably the most valuable. Um, but the toxins end up in everything, the phytoplankton, which is the very bottom of the food chain, and then that's moving up the food chain with everything that eats the phytoplankton and then whatever eats the fish. And in our local waters, um, killer whales, I think is the main example that I can think of. Um, a lot of their young are dying, like they're not being able to give birth to live, um, I don't even know what you call a baby whale. <laughs> okay, calf, <laughs> thank you. That's how much of a scientist I am. Um, but the, the mothers are, um, their, their milk is so toxic from these microplastics that they're no longer able to give birth. Uh, so that's, it's, and we're eating fish. We're all filled with plastic because of the food we're eating, so. <laughs> so uh, that's, that's really true because uh, uh, we do the beach cleanups and only 30% of uh, plastic flood and 70% uh, sink. So that's 70%. We don't have a program yet, and not that many organizations got programs. So that, yes, it's a breakdown to a microplastic. So we are, we are also going to create a new program with the uh, University of uh, Vancouver Island. It's coming up this summer. So we're going to, we program called Gap Year. So after the high school, before the university, uh, kids don't have much to do. So they create a new program. So we are going to go uh, take these kids out and uh, show them the leadership skills, how to create the expeditions, and like how to uh, do basic uh, these tasks. And also, we're going to use the labs from the university. And we're trying to get all the soil samples, and also water samples, and uh, create a database. Uh, what is the microplastic levels in BC? We don't have much information on this. So we are trying to do something in uh, educational-wise. Totally agree with your point. Like, yeah, it is in our food chain, and uh, we are eating that every day. Uh, you mentioned that you see a lot of plastics with uh, packaging or labeling that's coming from other countries. How can we c encourage people in other countries that, uh, that this is a problem that everybody has to solve? I guess just education and spreading knowledge, talking to each other sending each other links and research and education and starting the dialogue, starting the communication and raising awareness about it because a lot of countries don't even think about it. So just talking. Thank you guys so much for sharing. Um, I can't help but think of like mom and pop's diner using styrofoam packaging or something and, and then the City of Vancouver's recent efforts to address like single-use plastics, like you're talking about, and d do you know if that would cover that scope? Like, what kind of policy change that would be? Have have you guys considered that? And then I guess the second part to that question is, do you know of any precedents um, of cities 
um, in the world that have done that well or are working on that. So a uh, couple cities already worked on that. Montreal already banded the uh, polythene, uh, like the regular bags for the grocery stores, and Victoria done that. Tofino working on it. Vancouver, there are some conversation we heard of, but I don't have much information on that. So we were trying to run a couple campaigns, uh, like to ban the straws and a couple other projects. But uh, then uh, at the same time, we had the sorting came through, and we got La like way too much materials than we expected. So we had to change our priority. So we had to stick and we had to get that task done. So because of that, we had to delay some uh, some of our projects. But uh, I know there are some organizations talk about it to the city council too. And they are, there are some conversations happening. But I don't know the exact details yet though. I was gonna talk about this in a minute, so you beat me to it, um, just to add, this is a huge thing for municipalities. Um, I don't know if there's anyone from New Westminster in the house, but last night one of our city councillors put forward a motion to ban plastic bags and straws in New Westminster. So really what you guys can all do as citizens who care, I encourage you to email your mayor, email your city council. Like It's a local level to start at, and if you let them know that you care about these initiatives and that you know what this matters to you, the more voices we have, the more that we can do it as a community and start at the municipalities and kind of branch out and say like, you know, if our neighbors are doing it, let's all do it. Victoria's leading the charge, which is great in BC and like you said, Montreal, and now New West is on board, it's super awesome. But you guys are here, you guys care, so that's super awesome and I love it. So go home, figure out what your mayor, mayor's email is, you can Google it, everything's on the internet. You can find all your city councillors, email every single one of them tonight and say, hey, you know what, why don't we take a look at single use initiatives and like, why don't we start and put something in place? And I think that's really the best way to start and push it forward. Hi, is there any talk federally of considering banning certain products from just coming into Canada, given a lot of these products that we're importing come from other countries and they have a negative effect on our environment? So I don't think there are many conversations around it. So that's why like, you know, all these organizations got step up and we wanted to create the legislation behind it. And G5 Summit is coming. So Canada wanted to do a different, like, you know, approach this problem. But they did not really uh, like you know describe like how they're gonna do it. Hopefully, they will describe it soon. And uh, if we can get these legislations going, so that's gonna help every single organization who works along uh, this uh, path. So they can get the support from the government, and government has to do something about it. Right now, I don't know much about it. Like we don't, we didn't hear much for sure. I would also imagine that with the motion one five one, there is the dialogue of like banning the the use of microplastics and changing um, like the use of them industrial and consumer so I imagine just naturally with how this progresses is that a lot of the materials that are being single use are coming from out of country so to imagine naturally that might just happen I just want to give a good example of uh, exactly what you're saying um, Monique, maybe you do that for uh, microbeads. Yeah. yeah, sure. Uh, microbeads. So those are little pieces of plastic that are put in the cosmetic products um, and toothpaste that were really common in Canada for the longest time ever. Like whatever you, whenever you buy any cosmetic products or not every single cosmetic uh, product, but the majority of them used to have this little plastic uh, that are the byproducts of industrial work. Um, from G uh, starting January 2018, the use of microbeads in cosmetics and toothpaste are, is prohibited. So that, that has been done in Canada, and that is something that has started here in Vancouver, but it was a conversation like that literally four years ago. Um, there were a couple of events, people were writing to city mayors, people were writing to MPs. Four years later, real legislation, that happened. So as Monique mentioned, really like all, all, and the best thing you can do is just talk to whoever you want to talk to, to your MP, to your mayor, and that's, that's really gonna happen. Hi. 
Hey, um, so to bring it back to the, the plastic to fuel machine, um, I'm just wondering, could you talk about, I mean, could you, or I'm assuming you've considered like energy, it obviously takes energy to convert the plastic to the fuel. And then with the fuel, then we're contributing to carbon emissions. And so especially since the trash that you're cleaning seems to then um, reaccumulate at a site, are you afraid that we're potentially encouraging then like the use of fuels as opposed to investing in other energy sources or again like prevention of the trash? Um, the plastic to fuel machine is just one of the solutions. It's kind of like our last, last solution. Ideally, we would not be doing that. Um, ideally, we would have other solutions such as like recycling, up using, building materials and reusing them for other things. Um, so uh, to make the fuel, so that takes one kilowatt, so converted to one liter of uh, diesel usually. So that energy is like, as she said, like that's not something I wanted to, uh, like, you know, some areas, some remote areas, we don't have a solution. So this is one of the solution and bring the market value so then people will care. So we wanted to like, like I say, example, Panama. So they didn't care, they're just throwing it out again and again and again. Now it's end up in the ocean and it's coming to the shoreline and they don't have a solution. So that kind of area, it's ideal for them, but that is one of these solutions, but that's not the only solution. We like to use it like as a lush packaging and or like whatever that, that level uh, projects. If we can find other solutions, we keep on researching. So if we can figure something out, we like to go for that. That is our one of the solutions, but not the only solution. Also, if you want to come in and find us after, we do have the specs and the book for um, the plastic to fuel technology as well, if you want to look more into it with the exact numbers of what it produces. I think we have time for just one more question. So. Oh. Does anyone else have a question? Thanks. Um, the plastic to oil converter, is that also a an economic solution for the places where you install it? Like, do the locals, the locals operate that as a business and then get an economic boost from, from doing that? So they're incentivized to clean up the plastic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, that's our <laughs> idea because then we, ha we can do that. So then that money can stay in the uh, community and they can uh, use it for their projects. And right, so it boasts coastal, boosts coastal, coastal communities too. That's very that's cool. Right, yeah. Okay, thanks very much. It's time for the prize draw now, so this is exciting. Thank you, guys. <laughs> okay, hi, everyone. Um, I will make this quick because there were so many amazing questions. I really appreciated that. Um, I'm Monique. I'm the events director at Surfrider Vancouver, and I just wanted to talk to you really quickly about what we do, and I'm also going to give away some prizes, so everyone loves prizes. Um, first of all, I want to thank the Ocean Legacy team for presenting. That was awesome. Um, I know they inspire me every day, so I hope that some of you here who are new to them are going to leave here super inspired as well. Um, I also want to thank Great Canadian Shoreline Cleanup and the Aquarium for hosting us tonight. Um, we are really honored to be a part of your program and love working with you guys, so thank you. Um, <laughs> And really, again, thank all of you for coming out. Uh, it's really cool to see this big of a turnout and that you guys actually care about these issues and want to keep getting involved. So I just want to encourage that. And again, thank you for being here. Um, so what do we do as surfriders? So we are dedicated to the protection and enjoyment of the world's oceans, waves, and beaches. Um, we're active in the Vancouver community uh, year round. We hold monthly events. Um, from education evenings such as this, or um, film fest nights, or our regular uh, beach cleanups in the afternoons. We try to have something for everyone. So really what we want is we just want to encourage people to get out, to get involved, to learn about the issues, and to help clean and protect the places that we live and the places that we play. So if this sounds like something that you're interested in, we're always welcoming new volunteers and new ideas. Come talk to us, send us an email, find us on social, let us know, we would love to talk to you. Um, so cleanups and recycling are something we advocate for, but really, and especially tonight, what we've learned, 
it really is about taking individual responsibility. So nobody's perfect, we don't expect you to be, but we want to just encourage the conversation and continue moving towards a zero waste um, lifestyle. And with that, we can have less plastic out there that we're cleaning up. Um, so to end the evening, the uh, ever talked about topic, rise above plastics. I'm not preaching anything new here. We all know about these items. We all know it. They're simple, but they're also easy to forget. Um, get a water bottle. I see an awesome water bottle with stickers all over it. Put stickers on it. Make it your child. Take it everywhere. Coffee mugs. It's, you'd be surprised how many coffee cups are thrown away. It's horrifying. Um, to-go containers. I remember the first time that I took a to-go container to a restaurant to take home my leftovers in my own little container and I felt super weird about it but honestly the more you do it the more normal it is and you will be super happy that you do it. So little things that you can change in your life I totally encourage you to do that. We've talked about the plastic bags. Yes Victoria, yes New West. Continue that conversation. Um, also shop package free. Be, real, be a social cons a conscious consumer when you're out there. You don't need to have all this packaging your food. You can shop at farmers markets. You can shop local. Uh, you can shop at a zero waste store such as soap dispensary or the soon to open um, Nada Groceries, which speaking of, I don't know if you guys are doing anything on Sunday, but they are having a pop-up shop at Patagonia Vancouver from 11 to 6. So if you've never experienced zero waste shopping, if you've never been to one of their pop-up shops, totally go talk to them. They're amazing. Learn about it. It's, you'll see how easy it is and how awesome it is. Um, so on that note, that is going to segue us into some lovely door prizes. Do I have a helper with the door prizes? No? OK, I'm on my own. Cool. <laughs> oh, sure. Sure. Yeah. So first up, we have some grab bags from Nada Groceries. You could use these if you go on Sunday. And the winner is. Who wanted the most? All right. Josh Goldstein. What's up, Josh? Okay. Next up, keep drawing some names, man. We got lots of sweat. How many? Uh, draw me three. Okay. I don't know where to put this. Amanda? <laughs> Amanda Schoenard. I don't know if I pronounced that. Come on down. Kate Reynolds. Oh, we're so slow. And Amy Wu. Whoever gets here first, we have a surf rider hat, a t-shirt, or a rise above plastics bag. Perfect. So race to the finish. There you go. Um, we have, and you guys have that one. Yep. And lastly, the the gift from the um, Vancouver gift shop. So do you want to? Yeah. Oh, you got some more? Yeah. Oh. We just like to give stuff away, you guys. Robin Stewart. Okay, so now we have a really awesome donation uh, from the Glass Slipper. I don't know if you guys have heard of them, but these are glass straws. So if you're the type of person you need a straw, but please don't use a plastic straw, hey, you can have this with you. So we have, we're gonna give away 10 pairs. So I'm gonna, I'll call your names. You can comment when you leave, kind of make it a bit easier. Shelly. Sadowski, Shelley, woo, so I know you're here. Yes, Shelley. Oh gosh. Chris. Bennett? Oh. Yep, perfect. I got you, I got your handwriting. Uh, Chris Arlul, perfect. <laughs> 
Bo Fears. If that's your last name, that's really cool. Bella C. Perfect. How many am I at? One, two, three, four. Marissa, no last name, like Madonna. <laughs> Chelsea Mayer. And Will Govenlock. Perfect. Okay, you guys come find me afterwards. So just, yeah, another big thank you to the Surf Rider Foundation and Ocean Legacy for such an interesting and fascinating talk. Uh, so thank you everybody for coming. Um, I hope you consider coming to the lecture next Tuesday, which will answer in quite a lot of detail, I expect, some of the questions you have about how um, ocean plastics affect food chains and wildlife. Um, so yeah, thanks everybody. And just a quick reminder again, um, this lecture has been live streamed. Um, and obviously we're making this as accessible as possible to everybody. So if you can donate a few dollars on your way out so that we can keep doing this, that would be absolutely fantastic. Thanks very much.